Identity theft is the fastest growing Welcome to my lesson on getting started with Windows XP, Microsoft's popular operating system. In this lesson, you'll learn what a computer system is comprised of and how it processes information. You'll discover the types of hardware that make up a computer system and what functions they serve. In addition, this lesson explains the basic features of the Windows working environment. You'll learn how to identify and use the Windows desktop tools. Then, we'll look at file management. And finally, you'll see how to change settings for the way you use your computer. Before we start the lesson, I'd like to introduce you to my student assistant, Suzanne. Just follow along with her, and you'll be using this program in no time at all. A computer system is actually comprised of three elements. The hardware, which you can see and touch. The software or programs which allow you to create the documents and projects you need. And you, the user, the most important part of the system. To check out computer hardware components and understand what they do, return to the main menu and see my next section, Inside Your Computer. This is a special interactive section that lets you choose what you want to see from a variety of topics. To move on with learning Windows, go to the desktop section. Whenever you're ready, let's get started. Ever wonder what goes on inside a computer? Do you understand terms like hardware, CPU, RAM, megabytes, and megahertz? In this interactive section, we'll help you make sense of computer terminology by taking you inside a computer and explaining what each part is and what it does. When you pass your cursor over any computer part, it will highlight, revealing the name of that component. Just click on the component to find out more about it. For more in-depth information on input and output devices, you can click on those buttons to see what these devices have to offer. The monitor is the display that shows us what the computer is doing. Monitor resolution determines the quality of the image you see displayed. That quality is measured in pixels per inch or PPI. Pixels are tiny dots of light that make up the screen image. The number of pixels per inch defines a monitor's pixel resolution. A high-resolution monitor would have a minimum of 1,024 by 768 pixels. 1,024 is the number of horizontal pixels on your monitor, and 768 is the number of vertical pixels. The more pixels, the sharper the image on your monitor. Sound is an integral part of today's multimedia computer environment. Many programs and websites feature music and sound effects. To enjoy the audio component of CD-ROMs, DVDs, and websites, you need speakers. The keyboard is the main component for entering data and instructions into your computer. The standard is the Windows Enhanced Keyboard, which has special keys to handle different tasks. To identify the different key groupings, move your mouse pointer over that section. For a more detailed description, click on a specific grouping. The main keypad. This area of the keyboard is the most commonly used section. It contains all the number and letter keys used for most applications, as well as several special modifier keys. The, move the movement keys located on the right side of the keyboard allow you to navigate quickly. For example, pressing the Control and Home keys together while in a Word document will take you quickly back to the top of that document. 
The arrow keys. The arrow keys, also known as cursor keys, allow you to move your screen pointer up, down, right, or left without using your mouse. The numeric on the far right of the keyboard, the numeric keypad can be used to make 10 key calculating easier than using the number keys across the top of the keyboard. The function keys. The function keys at the top of the keyboard are used by themselves or in conjunction with the control, alt, and shift keys to provide many different functions depending on what software you are using them with. For example, with Microsoft Word, you can bring up the Help menu by pressing the F1 key. The Another important component of your computer is the mouse. The mouse allows you to use point-and-click commands to select options on your screen. It is the easiest and fastest way to give commands to your computer. Your mouse has two or sometimes three buttons that you press or, in computer terms, click to perform certain actions. The left mouse button is used to do most common actions. The right button is used to open shortcut menus for the program or feature we're working with. Some mice have a middle button that can be used for special features for specific application programs, such as Microsoft Word. And one more feature that's included with some mouse models these days is the roller wheel, a small wheel located between the two buttons. This wheel is often used for quick page scrolling up and down a document or web page. The back of your computer contains a number of connectors for plugging in devices. Pass your mouse pointer over a connector to see which device it's for. This is where you, this is where you plug in your power cord and switch on the computer. Here's where you plug in your mouse. This is where you plug in your keyboard. Here is where you plug in your USB devices. This is where you plug in a non-USB printer. This is where you plug in your COM port. Com this, this is where you plug in your COM port. COM ports can be used for network communication and connecting external devices. Due to this is where you plug in your COM port. COM ports can be used for network communication and connecting external devices. Due to speed limitations, COM port usage has been largely replaced by USB. This is where you plug in your microphone. Here's where you plug in your speakers. This is your line-in input. You can listen to audio devices such as CD and MP3 players by connecting them here. The game controller connection allows the use of game pads, joysticks, and steering wheel controls when playing computer games. Roll your cursor over the inside components of your computer to identify them. Then click to learn more about them. The hard drive stores your operating system and software programs. It also can store the data that you create when you use programs. Hard drives are included in all computers and are the fastest and most convenient type of storage. The new ones can hold many gigabytes of information. A gigabyte is 1,000 megabytes. Hard drives are considered permanent storage devices, but they are not indestructible. The best way to protect yourself against hard drive failure is to back up important data on floppy disks or other storage options, such as external hard drives, writable CD-ROM, or DVD media. The CD-ROM is a permanent storage disk. ROM stands for read-only memory. The standard CD-ROM holds 650 to 700 megabytes of information. 
You cannot write or alter information on a standard CD-ROM disk. You can write information to CDs if you have a CDR drive. This type of CD drive allows you to write to blank recordable CDs. The floppy disk drive handles floppy disks. Floppy disks are the smallest and cheapest type of permanent storage. Floppies can hold up to 1.44 megabytes of information. Network cards allow your computer to communicate with other computers or printers and connect to the Internet via a network. Both standard and wireless network cards are available, depending on which type of network you are using. Modems are used to connect computers to phone lines and the Internet. The modem translates the phone line's analog signal to digital so your computer can understand it. Modems receive information at different speeds. Most modems today are 56K, which means they transfer data at a rate of 56 kilobits per second. The video card is the device that tells your monitor what to display. It plugs directly into the motherboard. Video cards vary in capability. High-end gaming and multimedia software often require more powerful video cards to display their graphics and animation. The power supply is the unit that distributes power evenly to the various components inside the computer. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. It is your system's short-term memory, holding information for the document or item you are currently working on. RAM doesn't store information, so if the power is turned off, everything in RAM disappears. The amount of RAM in your computer is important because it determines the size and number of programs you can run on your computer at the same time. RAM also determines the amount of data that can be processed by the CPU chip at any given time. RAM is measured in bytes and megabytes. A byte is about the same as one character, like the letter A or the number 1. A megabyte is 1 million bytes. Most computers today come with at least 256 megabytes of RAM, which is the minimum needed for running your software and hardware. You can usually add more RAM for even faster performance. The central processing unit, also known as the CPU, is the part of the computer that actually computes. This chip processes the data and instructions that you enter with your keyboard and mouse. The results are sent to a device such as your monitor or your printer. The speed of the CPU determines the performance of your computer by how fast it can read instructions and then execute them. Megahertz is the electronic speed with which your CPU can process information. The higher the number, the faster your system. The motherboard is the main circuit board because it has slots and pathways to connect all the components of a computer, such as the CPU, RAM, modem, video card, and sound card. Microphones can be connected to your computer to record sounds or to have conversations with others. These conversations can be held over the Internet and may include video cameras for seeing who you are talking to. 
They're useful for conducting remote business to business conferences. Digital cameras work much like traditional film cameras, but with some important advantages. They store images either in internal memory or in memory cards, which then can be transferred to your computer. No film is needed, so there's no development cost. Most digital cameras have an LCD screen, so you can instantly view images you have taken. Scanners are like digital photocopiers. They copy documents and photographs and send digital files to your computer, which can then be edited and printed or sent online to another computer or location. Game controllers allow users to play computer games without needing to use the keyboard or mouse. These devices come in a variety of designs. Equipped with various joysticks and buttons, these handheld controllers make game playing more realistic, fun, and exciting. Printers are output devices that produce hard copies of documents and graphics that you have created with computer programs. There are two basic types of printers available today. Inkjet printers, which print tiny dots on the paper, and laser printers, which fuse ink and paper in a heat process. With inkjet printers, the greater the dots per inch, or DPI, the better the resolution. Both these printer types can print color and graphics and produce high-quality results. Portable external hard drives are easily connected to most computers and can store large amounts of data. People often use these affordable units to make a backup copy of a computer's hard drive. We'll begin our tour of the Windows desktop by taking a look at Suzanne's screen. Suzanne has minimized her open programs, and the only thing displayed on her screen is the desktop. Viewers will use Suzanne's screen to point out the features of Windows. We have a plain colored blue background on our screen. You may see something else. Depending on what type of computer you have, which settings you may have chosen, and the programs you have installed, your Windows screen may look different than Suzanne's. Don't worry if it looks different. We will make some changes in a moment that will make all our screens look pretty much the same. Let's briefly go over what Windows is. As an operating system, Windows handles all the functions that make it possible for you to use the computer. It is your user interface, which means it gives you a structured set of messages and commands to communicate with the system. It manages the resources of the entire system, all the hardware components, as well as all the programs that are running. Windows serves a purpose similar to a traffic cop, but instead of directing traffic, it directs the movement of data between the input, output, and storage devices and the CPU. The Windows operating system handles all of these basic system tasks and more. Let's take a closer look at your Windows desktop and learn how to use the tools that are included there. The Windows screen view is called a desktop because it holds tools similar to those you may have on your office desk. Just like a regular desk, you may find documents or file folders scattered around. These are placed here so you can find and open them easily. The Windows desktop is the plain colored or pictured background on your screen, and on top of that are images of icons, folders, and files. Icons are the smaller images usually lined up along the left side of your desktop. These represent programs and folders of information stored on your computer. Folder icons look exactly like a filing cabinet paper folder and perform the same function. They store documents and other information. A folder on a computer can also store computer programs. Files or document icons look like a page of paper. Another important part of the desktop is the taskbar. 
it usually appears across the bottom of the screen. In addition to displaying the Start button, which is used to access everything on your computer, the taskbar has other functions. The taskbar displays names of programs or documents you have open on your computer. Suzanne has some programs currently open, and although they are minimized so they don't appear on the screen, we can still see their names here on the taskbar. On the right side of the taskbar is the notification area for utilities that run when you start your computer. And at the far right side of the taskbar is the clock, which displays the current time. We will go into more detail about these functions later in the lesson. The last item that appears on the desktop is your mouse pointer. It's the arrowhead image that moves on the screen as you move the mouse across the mouse pad. Go ahead and use your mouse to move the pointer in a small circle and get the feel for how it works. As we proceed through the lesson, you'll see the mouse pointer change shape in some situations to indicate special actions available to you. Your mouse has two, or sometimes three, buttons that you press or, in computer terms, click to perform certain actions. The left mouse button is used to do most common actions. The right button is used to open shortcut menus for the program or feature we're working with. Some mice have a middle button that can be used for special features for specific application programs, such as Microsoft Word. And one more feature that's included with some mouse models these days is the roller wheel, a small wheel located between the two buttons. This wheel is often used for quick page scrolling up and down a document or web page. There are three actions you can perform with your mouse buttons. The single click, which is one rapid click of your mouse button, is usually used to select an item with your left mouse button. The double click, which is two rapid clicks, is used to open programs or invoke commands. And the last action is the click and drag, which is an action for moving items on your screen. Let's practice using the mouse as we choose a few things that will assure we all have the same screen settings. First, move your mouse pointer over the top of the icon that looks like a trash can with a recycle symbol on it and says Recycle Bin under it. Notice, when we roll our pointer over the icon, we get a message that the Recycle Bin contains the files and folders that you have deleted. These informative floating text boxes will appear as we move our mouse pointer over most of the items in Windows and other programs. With your pointer over the Recycle Bin icon, click your left mouse button once. Notice this changes the color of that icon. This means it is selected. Now, with your pointer still on the Recycle Bin icon, press your left mouse button down and hold it there. Once done, move your mouse to the right a few inches on the mouse pad. Now lift your finger off the button. We've just relocated the Recycle Bin icon to a new place on our desktop. This is the click and drag action, and we can use it for moving icons, files, folders, text, and even programs from one location to another. This is a handy feature that you can continue using as you learn more about Windows and other applications. There's one more topic I want to address before we move on. Viewers, if you installed Windows XP on a new computer, you may not have the My Computer icon on your desktop. If you don't find it, click your left mouse button on the Start menu. Move your pointer up to My Computer and click your right mouse button once. Clicking the right mouse button on an icon or in a specific area of a screen will often open a menu of options that pertain to whatever we clicked on. In this case, we have a list of choices for things we can do with a My Computer feature. See where it says Show on Desktop? If there's no check mark to the left of it, this means it's not a currently active command. Click your left mouse button on that menu item, and the My Computer icon will now be on your desktop. It may be behind your Start menu. We'll look in just a moment. Keep the right mouse button in mind as you continue exploring Windows. It's a useful place to find shortcuts and accomplish tasks related to the area you're currently working in. Press the Escape key on your keyboard to close the Start menu. Now move your mouse pointer on top of the My Computer icon and rapidly double-click your left mouse button. Be careful not to move the mouse while you're clicking 
or the computer will think you're doing a click and drag. Remember, the double click invokes an action. In this case, it opens the My Computer window. The left mouse button is the primary button used for most of the choices you make on your computer. So, for the rest of this lesson, when I ask you to click, you should assume I mean the left button. I'll tell you specifically when a right button click is needed. The My Computer window that appeared when we double-clicked the icon displays the contents of our computer. The icons we see inside the window represent our disk drives, our connections to other peripheral devices, and any folders we may have stored on our computer. With this window open, let's move on and explore what a window is and how it works. So what exactly is a window? A window visually defines a workspace on the desktop. Each time you open a program, it appears in its own window. You can have many windows open and overlapping each other at the same time. Once they're opened, you can move, size, and minimize them any way you want. When you opened My Computer, a new button appeared on the taskbar. As long as a program is open, that is, as long as the program is loaded in memory, it will have a button on the taskbar. We'll investigate the taskbar in greater detail later, but you can see now that an icon, a window, and a taskbar button all represent the same program. Let's go over the elements of a window. The colored bar at the top of the window is called the title bar, and it tells us the name of the program or file open in the window, in this case, my computer. On the right-hand corner of the title bar are three buttons. Move your pointer to the first one with the single line on it. This is the Minimize button. Click on it. The window disappears from our screen, but the button still shows on the taskbar, showing us that the program remains active and loaded into memory. We can use the Minimize button to unclutter our desktop, but still keep a program running and instantly available. To reopen the window, just click the My Computer button on the taskbar. Go ahead and do that now. The middle button on the title bar is the Maximize Restore Down button. When the window is less than full, clicking this button will maximize it to full size, filling the screen. And if the window already fills the entire screen, clicking this button will reduce it to less than full screen size or restore down. Move your mouse pointer to the middle button where both the tooltip and the symbol on the button indicate the window state. Suzanne's symbol is currently at restore down, meaning her window is currently in the maximized full screen size. Click once to see the change. And our window is now in the restore down state. Another way to quickly maximize and restore down our windows is to double click the title bar. Go ahead and do that now. And our window size increases to maximum window size. Double click it again. And we're back to our reduced window. When you're done experimenting, leave this window in its less than full size state so you can see the desktop behind it. The third button, the X, is the close button. This one closes the window and takes the button off the taskbar. That is, it exits the program and takes it out of the computer's memory. Go ahead and click it. Now we'll reopen the window, but this time let's do it a different way. Right click once on the My Computer icon, and a menu of options appears. From here, we can open the My Computer folder again, as well as choose from a variety of other tasks and commands. Move your pointer to the Open command, click to select it, and here's our My Computer window displayed on the desktop once again. There's one more control button on the title bar. See the picture of a computer on the far left side? Put your pointer on it and click and a menu of options opens on the screen. Choosing from these commands is another way to size and close your window.
Click anywhere outside the menu to close this menu. We can use the title bar of the window as a place to grab onto the window and move it. Move your pointer over the title bar and click and hold your left button. Drag the window to the left an inch or so. Let's open a second window. Move your pointer on top of the recycle bin icon. With your mouse pointer on the recycle bin icon, double click to open that window. The recycle bin stores deleted files until we decide to permanently delete them. If that window fills up the screen, double click the title bar to reduce its size so that you can see both windows and the desktop. It's okay if they overlap. If the Recycle Bin window covers up the My Computer window, click and drag the title bar of the Recycle Bin to one side until you can see part of both windows. We now have two buttons on our taskbar, indicating that two programs are loaded into memory. This is an example of multitasking. Multitasking means you can have more than one program open at the same time. This Windows feature allows you to easily switch from one program to another and to move or copy information between programs. Since it's the last one we opened, the Recycle Bin button on the taskbar is selected and is the active window. Only one window on the desktop can be active at a time, but it's easy to switch from one active window to another. One way is to click the taskbar button of the program you want active. Click the My Computer button. The My Computer window now appears on top of the Recycle Bin window. This is another way to tell which window is active. It will appear to be on top of the other windows. And notice its button on the taskbar is dark blue, while the Recycle Bin button is lighter, meaning it's not active. If both windows are maximized to full screen, clicking on the taskbar is a good way to bring one or the other window on top. Here's another quick way to activate a window or move it on top. Since we can see a part of the Recycle Bin window behind the My Computer window, just click once any place in the window. It now appears on top of the My Computer window. We can also resize a window so it's easier to see both. This is useful if we're frequently moving back and forth doing work in both windows. Move your mouse pointer to the left edge of the Recycle Bin window called the border. As you move close to the border, watch the pointer. When it changes to a black two-sided arrow, you can click and drag the border to change the size of the window. Move it a couple of inches to the right and release the mouse button. The window resizes itself a bit smaller. Now click the My Computer window again to activate it. Notice how the My Computer window is split into two parts. The left side column is divided into sections containing various commands and locations like system tasks, other places, and details. The right side lists different places on our computer. We'll look at these sections in more detail in the next section. Watch what happens to those sections when we grab the left side of this window and make the window about half its size. The split window view doesn't show up properly when the window is small. The left column disappears, and we only see the objects contained in the window. We can resize from any border, sides, top, or bottom, and from the corners we can size diagonally as well. Move your pointer to the lower left corner of this window and you'll see a diagonal two-sided arrow. Click and drag the window back to a larger size so we can see all the information displayed here. Sizing windows is a good mouse exercise to improve hand-eye screen coordination and it comes in handy if we have several windows open on the desktop. Feel free to pause the lesson here if you'd like to practice this some more. When you're ready, close the two windows. Before we move on, let's look at a way to organize the icons on our desktop. On a blank part of your desktop, click the right mouse button. As we saw earlier, right clicks will usually bring up a menu, often known as a shortcut or context menu. A right button click opens the kind of menu almost anywhere in any Windows program, but the commands on the menu 
will be different depending on the area your mouse is pointing to. This menu shows commands that control the desktop. Commands that are gray and barely visible are not available at this time. This is another of the context-sensitive features of Windows. Each of these menus will be different according to where you are in a program and what you are doing. On this menu is the Arrange Icons By command with a little arrow pointing to the right. This arrow means another set of options, also known as a submenu, will display when you select that item. Move your mouse pointer over the words Arrange Icons By. As you do that, notice the words change color, indicating that item is selected and our submenu appears with more choices. Move your pointer straight right into the submenu, then down the list of options until the Auto Arrange command is highlighted. Click it. After you select this command, the Recycle Bin icon rearranges itself to line up with the other icons on the left side of the desktop. Click your right button again on a blank part of the desktop and select Arrange Icons By. Notice the Auto Arrange now has a check mark next to it. This check mark indicates this command is a toggle command that can be turned off and on. The check mark means it is on. Having Auto Arrange on automatically arranges the icons on your desktop so you can't place them anywhere you want to. For this lesson, let's leave the command off, so make sure there is no check mark next to Auto Arrange. Now try clicking and dragging some of the icons around the desktop. By turning off Auto Arrange, we can now position our icons anywhere on the desktop grouping them or separating them in a way that's convenient. This is handy if we want to put our most often used icons together for easy access. When you've placed your icons where you want them on the desktop, let's move on to our next section, exploring the contents of a window. We've seen how the title bar, the task bar, and resizing will help us manage our window's appearance on the desktop. Now let's take a closer look at the contents that help us perform the tasks inside that window. Begin by opening My Computer from the desktop. If you don't see both sides of the window, click and drag a border so both the System Tasks column on the left and the larger pane on the right are displayed. The main components of the window are the menu bar, toolbars, scroll bars, status bar, and workspace. The My Computer window is split into two parts. The column on the left displays system tasks, which we can access by clicking on these icons. Other places, where we can quickly navigate to different areas of our computer, and details, which give us information about the window we have open. Clicking the little double arrows next to these headings will open and close lists displaying different options for each heading. On the right side of the window, the white area showing the files, folders, and other information is called the workspace. This style of window only appears in the Windows desktop system. We'll see as we move forward that not all windows are split like this one and that some have only a workspace area without the column on the left. Depending on your window setup, your My Computer window may look slightly different than Suzanne's. Before we go any further, let's look at a feature that will allow us to adjust the appearance of our window so we all have the same view. On the standard toolbar, find the Views icon. It's the last one on the right, the one that looks like a chart. Click it, and we get a drop-down list of format options for viewing the contents of our workspace. On Suzanne's menu, there's a dot next to Tiles, which means that's her current view. By clicking through the different options, we see that each one offers a unique way to view the files and folders on our computer. Feel free to return later and select a view that you like, but for now, let's all use the Icons view, so make sure that one is selected. 
The files, folders, and hardware devices on our computer are now represented by icons. We'll come back here and work with these a little later. At the top of the window is the menu bar. It is almost always located immediately below the title bar. We've already looked at items on a menu, so we have an idea of how they work by clicking to select them. The file, edit, view, and help menus are standard Windows menus that appear in almost all Windows applications. Many programs will have additional menu items related specifically to that program. Each of these menu items has more choices located in a drop-down menu. Click the File option. A drop-down menu appears, showing us the choices associated with the File option. These choices will vary with the type of program we have running in a window. They also will change for particular actions we're doing. For example, notice that most of the choices we have now are grayed out, meaning they are not available. This is because we haven't selected any of the contents in the workspace. Make a note of what you see here. Then click once on the Local Disk C icon under Hard Disk Drives to highlight it. Now click the File menu again. Windows knows we have selected a drive and it now displays more options we can choose from while working with that drive. Press your Escape key to close this menu. We can use the keyboard or mouse to open menus. Press and release the Alt key on your keyboard. Notice that this action added an underlined letter to each of the menu bar options. You can now press the key with the underscored letter to open that menu with the keyboard. For example, press the letter V for the View drop-down menu. When the menu opens, you can see that each of the commands displayed here also has one letter underlined. Simply press that key to select that command. For all menu items, a click on any of these choices may immediately cause a specific action to happen. Or it may open a submenu of additional choices. We've seen some of this in the menu commands used already in this lesson. Let's look at some of the symbols Windows uses to help us determine the currently available options or status of menu commands. Plain commands without symbols are immediately started. An arrow indicates a cascading submenu of options will appear. A three dot ellipsis indicates a dialog box will appear that displays additional choices, which we can then accept by clicking OK. We'll see plenty of dialog boxes as we move through my lesson. A check mark or dot indicates that menu option is already selected and can be turned off and on. Let's make some changes to the appearance of our My Computer window. A few moments ago, we chose the Icons view, so that selection is marked with a dot. Let's change to List. Go ahead and click it. The view of our icons in the right side of the window immediately changes to a text list of the contents along with a small icon to the left of each item. This will affect this window only. Every time we make a choice in the View menu, it disappears, so we must reopen it to make additional choices. Open the View menu again. This time, move your pointer over Toolbars. It has a right pointing arrow on it, so another submenu appears. Make sure we have check marks next to Standard Buttons, Address Bar, and Links. You may have to open the View menu a few times to accomplish this. Also, be sure Lock the Toolbars is not selected. And last, from the main view menu, make sure the status bar option has a check mark showing it is active. It should be just beneath the toolbar's menu item. Click it if yours doesn't have the check mark. We'll come back and discuss each of these components in the next few minutes. These menu bar choices contain just about all the commands you will ever use in a program. Below the menu bar in most windows, you'll usually find one or more toolbars. The first row is the standard toolbar, which has choices for some of the most commonly used commands in a program. These commands can also be found in the menu bar choices, but from here, they give us quick, one-click access to each command. 
Like other menus, if an option stays pale or grayed out, it's not an active command. Some buttons have arrows to indicate additional menus or dialog boxes, and the command options will also vary with the type of program we have running. We'll see how they work as we proceed through the lesson. We can't see all the information in the left side of the window, so a scroll bar is displayed along the side. A scroll bar is a vertical or horizontal bar along the side or bottom of a window with a slider bar inside and an arrow button at each end of the bar. Anytime you see a scroll bar, it indicates there's more information to see. Viewers, if your window doesn't have a scroll bar, it's because the window is large enough to display all the information and you don't need one. To follow along with the lesson, you can reduce the window size so you'll have a scroll bar. Pause the lesson if you need to resize the window to make the scroll bars appear. Suzanne, move your pointer to the slider bar located inside the scroll bar. Click and hold your pointer on it and drag it down. As we pull down the slider bar, we can see the view in the left part of the window moving to show additional information further down on the page. When we drag the slider bar back up, the view follows, moving back to the top. Right below the standard toolbar is the address bar. The white field in the address bar displays the name of the current open window, My Computer. For those of you who are familiar with the internet, this is similar to the address bar in a web browser that displays the address of the website you are currently viewing. Click the drop down arrow to the right of the words My Computer. The drop-down list that opens is called a folder hierarchy, which is a map of the file storage locations on our computer. It's a slightly different way of representing the same information we see in the My Computer window. See, there's My Computer near the top of the list, and indented below that are the disk drives on our computer. Viewers, your list may include different items than Suzanne's, depending on how your system has been set up. But everyone should have a hard drive, which is usually identified by the letter C. Click on the C drive. By selecting the C drive, our window view has changed completely. The My Computer window has been replaced with the C drive window. This is another example of how our desktop window acts like a web browser. When we select a new address, in this case a different location on our computer, the window changes to that view. If the right side of your window displays the message, these files are hidden, go to the System Tasks section on the left and click the Show the Contents of this Drive prompt. Your C Drive hierarchy of folders will now display. If you had other programs installed on your C Drive, they would appear in the Program Files folder. Double click that folder. And here is the list of all programs on our C drive. Let's see another example of opening folders in Windows. Click the down arrow to open the address field menu and locate the Recycle Bin folder. If you don't see it, you may have to use the scroll bar to find it further down the menu. Click it to open it. Here is a list of all folders and files we have deleted. They are sent to the recycle bin and held there until we permanently delete them from our computer. Notice the left and right arrows on the left of your standard toolbar. When you switched to a new address, the left arrow, known as the back button, became active. Click the back button, and our window returns to the view of the program files. Click the back button again. And we're back at the C drive view. Now click the right arrow, which is the forward button, and we're taken to the program files view. As you can see, it's easy to change the view of the current window, both from the address bar and by using the back and forward arrows. You may have noticed that as we press the back or forward arrows, the button on the taskbar changed as well to reflect the current window. The back and forward arrows and the address bar are features that are found in standard web browser windows, but they do not appear in most application program windows. I'd like to mention one more handy feature of the address bar. 
If you have an internet connection, you can even type a web address in the Windows address field and your computer will connect you to the internet and display that website in this window. Feel free to come back and try that on your own. Let's move on to the Links toolbar. This toolbar appears to the right of the address bar. Viewers, you may need to stretch out your window to see it, or you can make the address bar smaller. Move your mouse pointer to the vertical line between the address bar's Go button and the word Links. If you don't see it, you did not unlock the toolbars earlier in this section. The pointer will change to a two-sided arrow when you have the right spot. You should recognize this pointer symbol as the sizing indicator, which you can click and drag to the left to give a little more space to the links bar if it's needed. You can also arrange the toolbars by clicking and holding your mouse button on a toolbar name. Click and hold on links. Once the four-sided move arrow appears, drag it down and release the mouse button. The Links toolbar is now on its own toolbar. Move your pointer to the bottom of the Links bar. And when you see the two-sided sizing arrow, drag it back up without releasing the mouse button. Notice how you can save space by combining the toolbars. Maneuver the sizing arrow up, down, and sideways until we see the original display with the menu bar on its own line and the address and links bar on another line. Then release the mouse button. Now that we've learned how to resize our toolbars, let's get back to the links toolbar. Links are buttons, words, or phrases that you can click to connect directly to specific websites. And when you connect to a web page, its address shows in your address toolbar. These buttons can only make the connection, however, if your computer is connected to the internet. Next to the Links button, we see Customize Links. Clicking this will take you to a Microsoft site that gives you more instructions on how to add and delete websites to the Links toolbar. See the small double arrow at the right of the Links button? Click it. And a list of your links appears. When you point to a link, the web address shows in a pop-up tip. Clicking any of these links will take you to different Microsoft sites where you can get tips on how to do things and find out about products, updates, and other information pertaining to the Windows program. Again, you must have an internet connection for this to work. And if we increase the size of our window by clicking and dragging the right border, or by clicking the Maximize button, we can see more of the links we have in the Links toolbar. There's one more area I'd like to point out, and that's the status bar. The status bar is at the bottom of the window, and it does exactly what its name says, displaying information about the status of whatever is happening in the window. The types of information change according to what's occurring there. Let's take a closer look. Click the back button once to go to the C drive window. With the C drive selected, the status bar tells us how many objects or files and folders are listed here. Move your mouse pointer to the Program Files folder and click once. Now the status bar tells us about the number of objects selected. Depending on what is selected and the size of your window, it can display the size of the selected item and other information pertaining to the file. Viewers, if you have one or more files showing in this window, click one of them. The status bar now tells us the type and size of our file and when it was last modified. When using other computer programs, a quick glance at the status bar will give us information specific to that program. Before we move on, let's look at one more way to learn about files and folders in our window. Click inside the window. Then move the pointer slowly over the folders and files displayed there. As we pause over any one of them, a small box appears giving us information relevant to that item, such as size, folder names, and date last modified. This is a great way to learn about the contents of a file or folder without opening it. I think you'll find that these tools and skills become automatic very quickly once you've used them a bit.
It's time to move down to the bottom of the desktop and learn how the taskbar helps us manage the jobs running on your computer. The taskbar is the bar located at the bottom of the desktop screen. Let's start learning about the taskbar by making sure everyone has a similar view. Don't worry if some of the things we do here seem a little advanced at first. These techniques will teach us some valuable skills for controlling our computer settings. If you do not see the taskbar at the bottom of your screen, move your mouse pointer down slowly, and the taskbar should pop up when the pointer nears the bottom. Move the pointer to a blank place in the taskbar and click your right mouse button to open the shortcut menu. Click the Properties option at the bottom of the list. This opens the Taskbar and Start Menu Properties dialog box. From here, we can select options that control the appearance of our taskbar and start menu. Properties is the term for all the settings and choices defined for an object. In our case, the object is the taskbar and start menu. The dialog box contains the choices we can make to change their properties. Toward the top of the window are tabs for the taskbar and the start menu. Make sure the taskbar tab is selected to display that dialog box. The top section, labeled Taskbar Appearance, shows the left side of the taskbar, while the bottom section, Notification Area, shows the right side. Both sections have checkbox options to select. First, we do not want to lock the taskbar, so if the first box is checked, click to uncheck it. By keeping the taskbar unlocked, we can resize it or click and drag it to the sides or even the top of our screen. We'll try this in a few minutes. Viewers, if your taskbar was hidden, there will be a check mark in the next box labeled Auto Hide the Taskbar. Click in the box to remove that option for the remainder of this lesson. You can return and switch it back on later if you prefer. Click the remaining three boxes to match Suzanne's screen. To keep the taskbar on top, group similar taskbar buttons, and show quick launch. You may have noticed that as we selected our options, the preview window above the options changed to display how our choices would affect the taskbar. Watch how the preview area in the next section changes as we select more options. In the Notification Area section, we want a check mark next to Show the Clock and make sure there is no check mark next to Hide Inactive Icons. The purpose of the Hide Inactive Icons feature is to reduce the number of icons displayed in your taskbar by hiding the ones you don't use often. This helps keep your taskbar uncluttered. When you hide the inactive icons, the taskbar selection will change here according to what you use the most. You can leave this option on if you like, but some choices we make during the lesson may not display right away. For this lesson, I recommend leaving this option off and returning later to switch it back if you like. Click OK to close the dialog box and activate the properties that you selected. The taskbar has four areas used for the tasks it handles. You've already seen the task list where buttons appear when a window is open. The Start button opens the Start menu where you have access to all the programs and files on your computer, whether or not they have icons on the desktop. The Quick Launch toolbar is right next to the Start button. Unlike a toolbar in a window, this is for desktop functions such as launching programs. The Notify or Status area is at the far right end of the taskbar. Here you see the time displayed, as well as a set of icons that may change from time to time according to events on your computer. Like the other desktop objects, such as icons and windows, we can also move the taskbar around our desktop. Let's do that now. Move your pointer to the taskbar and click in a blank space, holding the button down after you click. Drag the pointer toward the middle right edge of your screen. As you move the pointer toward the right, the taskbar disappears from the bottom 
and snaps to the right side of the screen with the Start button at the top. Using the same technique, we can place the taskbar at the top of the screen or on the left side. We can make it wider as well. Move your mouse pointer to the left edge of the taskbar until it changes to the two-sided sizing arrow and drag it to the left about an inch. Well, that takes up way too much of the desktop, so let's return it to the bottom and to standard size. Just click in a blank space and drag it back to the bottom of the screen. We've seen the controls for the appearance of the taskbar. Now let's see what it can do. Move your mouse pointer to the far right over the clock. The pop-up tip also shows today's date. Next to the clock will be icons representing programs running in the background, such as a virus checker. Viewers, your icons will differ from Suzanne's depending on the programs you have on your computer. These programs are automatically started when you turn on your computer. You can check what they are by moving the mouse pointer over them and reading the pop-up tip. Let's look at five commands that manage the arrangement of our open windows on the desktop. Since you probably only have the Program Files window open from the last section, we'll open a second window first so we can demonstrate. Right-click the My Computer icon on the desktop, and from the drop-down menu, select Open. With two windows now open and overlapping on our desktop, right-click on a blank space of the taskbar again. Here are the four window options, Cascade Windows, Tile Windows Horizontally, Tile Windows Vertically, and Show the Desktop. Click Tile Windows Vertically. See how that works? The desktop displays as much of the two windows as possible, with one right next to the other. Horizontal will do the same thing in a top to bottom fashion. Right click on the taskbar again and choose the Cascade Windows option. This lines up your open windows right under each other, displaying only the title bars of the windows in the background. From here, we can click the title bar and drag the top window down so we can see the one beneath. Back on the taskbar menu, we have options for undoing the cascade, which would bring us back to the tile windows vertically view, and show the desktop, which would hide our open windows and display them as buttons on the taskbar. Let's leave our windows as they are and look at the buttons on the left side of the taskbar. With our taskbar drop down menu still open, select Toolbars to see the submenu. This item refers to the set of buttons that appear just to the right of the Start button. The check mark indicates that the toolbar currently showing is Quick Launch. On Suzanne's taskbar, this includes icons for launching Internet Explorer and other programs installed on Suzanne's computer. You can see in this toolbar list that the Address and Links toolbars, which we saw in our tour of the contents of a window, can also be added to the taskbar along with several other choices. Before we move on, let's clean up our desktop a bit. From the menu, select Show the Desktop. The windows disappear from the desktop but are still active and showing on the taskbar. When you're ready, let's move along and look at the workhorse of the taskbar, the Start button. The Start button on the taskbar is comparable to the menu buttons in a window. Although you have shortcuts, icons, and toolbars elsewhere, this is the ultimate source for every program and file located on your computer. Click the Start button. That opens the Start menu, where you can start programs, open files, change the system configuration, find help, and restart and turn off your computer. The Start menu has seven sections. Let's take a quick look at each one, then come back and examine some of them more closely. The section at the top of the left column contains icons that open specific programs installed on your computer, 
such as your internet connection. The section directly below that displays programs that have recently been opened on your computer. This list changes as new programs are opened and they replace earlier ones. At the bottom of the left column is All Programs. Clicking this button opens the complete list of your computer's programs and applications, allowing immediate access. At the top of the right column are standard Windows features for navigating around our computer and opening documents, graphics and photos, and other items. The next section is for customizing the appearance and functionality of our computer and for quickly connecting to Internet connections. Moving down the column, the next section is where we go for Windows help and support. To search for documents and other items on our computer. And to open documents, folders, programs, and websites. The bottom section has two commands, Log Off and Turn Off Computer. Click Log Off. A warning box opens asking if we want to log off. Logging off leaves the operating system software in RAM memory, but clears your desktop and any custom settings for one user and prepares the system for a different user to sign on. If we had multiple users on this computer, such as different members of a family or office workers, we could click Log Off here and then switch users without having to fully shut down the computer. This would allow each user to have their own sign-on and password with their own choices for desktop setup. But Suzanne is the only user on her computer, so there's no reason to do that now. Click Cancel, and click Start Again. This time, click Turn Off Computer. We now have a dialog box with three button choices, Standby or Hibernate, Turn Off, and Restart. Shutting down your computer properly is very important. If you don't shut down before turning off your computer, you can lose work or unintentionally change your Windows settings. There are several ways to correctly either exit or shut down your computer. The first button on the left is Standby. Choosing this option is a bit like putting your computer on hold. If you're going to leave your computer for a while but want it to keep running, Standby is the command to use. This puts your computer and monitor in a sleep mode, not using as much electrical power to stay running, and you don't have to exit any applications before going on standby. When you're ready to start working again, either press the power button on your computer once, or on some computers just press a keyboard key or move your mouse and you'll return to the place where you left off. It's not a bad idea to save any open documents before going into standby mode though because if your computer loses power for some reason, you'll have to start it up from the beginning again. A second option using this button is hibernation. Change the button to hibernation mode by holding down the shift key once, and the button will display the new name. Just like in standby mode, hibernation lets you pause your work without closing files and applications and then return to it later. The difference is that with hibernation, the current state of your system is recorded on your hard drive before shutting down. Even if your power fails, the system state is safely stored on the computer and will appear again as soon as you restart in exactly the place you left it. Release the Shift key to return the button to standby. The next button, Turn Off, is an important feature. Use this command whenever you want to completely turn off the computer. After selecting this option, Windows will begin an orderly shutdown, which will safeguard the files and programs on your computer. You should never turn off the computer with Windows or any other program still running. Make sure all programs are closed before you begin shutting down your computer. The shutdown process clears instructions for memory, logs off any other users, and prepares your computer for final shutdown. When your computer starts acting sluggish or it isn't responding, you can use the third button to restart it. Computers can hang up for any number of reasons, and restarting shuts everything off and then reloads it. Restarting often fixes small problems. We don't want to turn off the computer yet, so click the Cancel button to close this window. Anytime you want to leave a dialog box without activating the commands in it, 
you can use Cancel or the X button. This will close the box without taking any action, even if you've made some selections. Since we are on the subject of restarting computers, I'd like to show you a quick way to restart your computer from the keyboard. Unfortunately, for many reasons, your computer will sometimes quit working and freeze up. Your mouse pointer won't work either, so choosing commands with that feature is not an option. When this happens, the best way out is to press your Control, Alt, and Delete keys at the same time. Go ahead and do that now, Suzanne. A window appears and we see our open programs running. If you're having problems, the Task Manager dialog box will appear, displaying that program as not responding. If you're following along with us and you didn't have any programs running, your desktop may not display the Task Manager box at this time. Sometimes a running program may be the culprit because it stops working, causing everything else to quit responding. Highlighting the problem program and choosing End Task may close that program and bring your computer back to life. If not, pressing Control Alt Delete again will restart your computer so you can start with a clean slate. You may lose work, but this is the best way to get your computer running again if it stops working. We won't restart the computer at this time, but I think you get the idea of how it works. Close the window by clicking the X button, and we're returned to the desktop. As a last resort, if the Control-Alt-Delete command doesn't work, you can press the power button on your computer, hold it in for about 4 seconds, then release it. The computer will shut down, and although you may have lost any unsaved files, you should be able to start it up again at this time. Let's go back and take a closer look at some of the Start menu options, but this time, let's open it using a different method. Many computer users these days have a Windows keyboard, which is specially designed to include two Windows keys. The Windows keys are located at the lower left corner and lower right corner of your keyboard, between the Control and Alt keys. If these keys are not on your keyboard, you don't have a Windows keyboard. Pressing the Windows key, usually along with another key, provides shortcuts for a number of functions that we'll use during my lessons. The first one is opening the Start menu. Press the Windows key once, and the Start menu instantly appears on your screen. Press it again, and the menu disappears. This is a quick shortcut for opening the Start menu, no matter what we're doing in Windows. Press the Windows key one more time to display the Start menu. If you don't have a Windows keyboard, go ahead and click Start to open the menu. We'll return to the Windows key for more shortcuts throughout my lessons. At the bottom of the list on the right is the Run command. This command is used primarily to start programs that don't reside on your computer, for example a game on a CD. It's also used to start the install process for new software programs you want to add to your computer. Go ahead and click the Run command. Most programs, like this Video Professor Lesson CD and many other programs you install from a CD, have an Auto Run command that starts it automatically so you don't need to use the Run command. If you put a CD into your CD drive and the Auto Run doesn't start, you can click the Run command, then type the name of the program, file or internet resource in this box and click OK. Windows will then find it and run it. If you don't know the name or location of the file you want to run, click the Browse button. Then from the Browse dialog box, choose the location of the file or program you want to run and click OK. Windows will open your selection and start running it. Let's say we want to open this CD. After clicking Browse from the Run dialog box, click the down arrow in the Look In field to open the drop-down menu. Find My Computer and click it, and look for the CD drive icon. Double-click to open it. Find the main program file. Sometimes it's a file that says Setup. In our case, this program file is called vidprof. Click once to select it, and then click Open. This puts the file in the Run dialog box. 
If you see an .exe extension on the file name, it is the right file to start a program. Clicking OK will start the program. You already have the CD running, so click Cancel to close the Run dialog box. Let's open our Start menu again. The Search command is another powerful tool available from here. Move your pointer over it and click. On the left of the window, we get a list of items under the heading, What do you want to search for? Search helps us look for pictures or music, documents, files and folders, or explore the Internet. We'll return here and learn more about the search feature in our second lesson. Close the search window for now, and open the Start menu again. Let's move on to Help and Support. Click that button. Help is pretty self-explanatory. This is a useful place to look for answers to specific questions about Windows. Clicking any of these links will open a page of tips and related links with even more information. We don't think you'll need much help after viewing our lessons, but if you do need some more specific information, come back here and look for the subject you need help with. Close the Help window and open Start again. Now we'll look at a major item on the Start menu, the All Programs command. You'll find it at the bottom left side of the menu. This is a quick way of opening any of the programs on your computer. Click All Programs to open it, or just pause the pointer there for a moment and it will open automatically. Here is the list of all the applications and tools residing on your computer. Many of them are fairly large and complex, designed for specialized tasks such as playing a game or doing word processing. Let's take a look at one of them. Move your mouse pointer to Accessories and pause it there. This opens a submenu. Whenever you see a small arrow to the right of a menu item, that means there's a submenu attached to it. Whenever you navigate to a submenu, make sure to first move your mouse straight right, then down, or you may lose your submenu when you accidentally roll over something else in the first menu. You can see how the submenus organize your programs into groups. In this case, we now see a list of all the Microsoft accessories. And from this submenu, there are even more submenus. Move the pointer down the submenu to Notepad. Once Notepad is highlighted, click once to launch the program. And in a moment, a new window appears on our desktop with a blank document. The title bar in this new window tells us that it is untitled in Notepad, meaning this document has not been named or saved yet. You will probably recognize the menu bar in this window, even though the specific commands are somewhat different from the ones we looked at previously. Since this is an application program, there is no address bar, links bar, or back and forward buttons. Also, since this is a very basic word processor, there is no toolbar or other options. However, if you need to keep quick notes, this is a good tool, and it will be sufficient for our purposes right now. The flashing black line in the blank workspace area is the insertion point, or the place text will appear when we start typing. We're going to create a file so we can see how to save it, a very important part of using your computer. We'll do that in the next section, so when you're ready, let's move on. Saving our files is one of the most important things we can do on the computer. This allows us to return and continue our work, send the file to another person, or just keep it for future reference. We could, as a matter of fact, save a completely empty file. The computer doesn't care. Let's put some words on our notepad document so we can see that something is really there. Type the words cats and dogs. If you make a mistake, just use the backspace key to erase letters to the left of the cursor and resume typing. When you're done, press the Enter key to make a new line and type, This is a document file. That's all we need to do. 
Now we have something in the document to save, so move your mouse pointer to the File menu and click. On the drop down menu, notice we have two save commands save and save as. The difference between them is we use save each time we open an existing document and make changes to it, and we use save as to rename an existing file as something else. Since this is a new document we're saving for the first time, it doesn't matter which one we use, since clicking either option will open the Save As dialog box. Go ahead and click Save. The Save As dialog box has several areas to choose and enter information. This information is necessary for the computer to save our file. The top of this dialog box has a Save In text box that should say My Documents. Yours may say something different if you've previously saved another file. If you don't see My Documents displayed here, click the down arrow on the right side of the box, and from the drop down menu, select My Documents. The Save As box also has some icons displayed to the right of the text box. We'll talk about these in a few minutes. Over on the left side of the window is a column containing icons for navigating to different places on our computer. There are handy shortcuts we can use as we move through the lesson. The middle space, called the Files and Folders area, shows files and folders that are already stored in that space. Suzanne hasn't saved any files yet, so none are showing. There are already some folders here that we can choose to save to, such as My Music and My Pictures. First, we need to choose a location to save our file. Click the drop down arrow next to My Documents. This list looks like the one we saw on the address bar in the My Computer window in an earlier section. It is, in fact, the same list, but we're coming into it from a different point here. Let's talk about it for a moment. There is a hierarchy to the Windows system. As you can see in this file structure, the desktop is toward the top. Everything on your system resides first on the desktop. While not part of the file structure hierarchy, the My Recent Documents folder is at the top. It's placed here to give us quick access to files we have been working on in recent days. This is useful if we can't remember the name of a document we were working on last week. Indented under Desktop are My Documents and My Computer. My Documents is a default folder made for us to store our files. We can use this folder or create our own folders in different locations to save our files. The next item is My Computer. This is where you can access the files, folders, and programs on your hard drive. The next level is the Drives, where we can choose to store our programs and files. For example, our floppy drive is the A drive, and the local disk is C, which is our hard drive. We also see the CD drive. Computers may have even more drives, but for our lesson, we will just look at these three on our computer. Here is an illustration of the hierarchy of a Windows-based computer. As we've seen, everything can be accessed from the desktop. Under that, the My Computer section contains a snapshot view of the contents of your computer. And under that, we find all the drives. The C drive is usually where all your programs and files are stored. Down from this level are folders where you store your documents, both business and personal. It is important that you understand file structure, so let me give you one more example of how it works. Let's use the office filing cabinet as an analogy. We'll call the floor the desktop, and the filing cabinet that sits on the floor represents my computer. The drawers represent the drives. As you open the C drive drawer, you can see folders for programs and other things stored on your computer. Within each folder are folders for specific projects. And within the project folders are the documents pertaining to that project. This gives you an idea of the organization of files, but I should mention that the files you save can be placed almost anywhere on your computer. You can save them on the desktop, in program folders, or on a floppy disk. There are some exceptions though. You can't save a file to the recycle bin, the My Computer window, or directly to the CD drive. Some people like to save their files within their own file structure on the C drive with different folders for different projects. 
The Windows My Documents folder has been created to hold files from all your programs, and if you're new to file structure, it's a great place to start saving files. Let's dig a little deeper into file structure before we save our file. A few minutes ago, we clicked the down arrow next to My Documents to open the drop down menu. From that list, click the C Drive icon. Here is a list of all the folders and files on the C Drive. Let's move down another level. Double click the Program Files folder. We now get a list of folders containing all the programs. We could keep moving down levels, for example, to a word processing program, and in that folder, create our own folder for personal documents or a specific project. However, in general, it's easier to locate your files if they're organized and kept in one area rather than spread all over your computer. That's why the My Documents folder is so convenient. Let's get back to our Save As window and see how it works. Look to the right of the Save In box and locate the icon of a folder with an up pointing arrow on it. This is the up one level button. When you find it, click it. Clicking this button takes us up one level back to the C drive. Click it again, and we're taken to My Computer. Click one last time, and we're back at the desktop. Now that we're at the top of the hierarchy, notice this button is grayed out or unavailable. Use the up one level button whenever you want to step back up through the folder hierarchy. The button just to the left with the left pointing arrow is the Go to Last Folder Visited button. Like its name suggests, clicking it takes you back through the folders you previously visited. Go ahead and click it. And we're back at My Computer. If you want to go directly to another level without clicking these buttons, you can choose a location from the Save In drop down menu. Click the down arrow to the right of the box. From the menu, choose Local Disk C. And up comes a list of the programs, folders, and files stored on Disk C, which is our hard drive. The icon to the right of the Up One Level icon is for creating new folders. We'll do that in a moment. Moving to the right, the next button is the View menu for choosing how files and folders display. Click it. This drop down menu lists the different ways we can display the files and folders in our window. Click Details. We now see the name of the file its size, what type of file it is, and when it was last modified. The size column is for individual files, so we don't see a size next to the folders. If the Save As window is too small to display all the information, you can increase the window size by clicking and dragging the box border, or just use the scroll bars at the bottom and right sides of the window. We'll come back and look at some of the other views later. For now, click the My Documents button on the left to open that folder. Let's create our own folder to hold our notepad file. Click once on the Create New Folder button. A new folder shows up in our My Documents list, outlined with a small box. It says New Folder, and the text inside is highlighted with a different color. This means the box is selected, and we can now type a new title for this folder, and it will replace the text. Type VP Lesson Files, and press the Enter key. We now have our very own folder to save this file in. Remember to create folders while you're in the location you want that folder to be placed. This folder now resides in the My Documents folder. Double click on that folder to open it, and notice our folder name is now displayed in the Save In text box. Our Files and Folders area is blank because currently there are no contents in our new folder. We can now create other folders as well as files to be stored in this folder. To save a file, we must select a location, which we just did, and we must give it a name. The File Name field just below the file's list space shows the name star.txt right now. That's not very informative, so we'll change it to a more descriptive name. 
Click your mouse button once on star.txt to highlight it and type VP test 1. Again, your new typing replaces the selected word. Whenever you're naming a file or folder, it's a good idea to choose something that describes it so you'll know what it is when you're looking for it later on. You can use up to 255 characters, including spaces for file names, but don't use certain characters like the asterisk or forward or backslash. Windows uses these symbols in its own naming process and won't accept them in your file and folder names. Below the file name is a text box labeled Save As Type, indicating that your file will be saved as a text type file. That's fine for this file. When you're saving documents while in other programs, the choices under the Save As Type box will display the different file types available to you with that program. With all our necessary information entered, let's save our file. Click the Save button. Look at the title bar. Instead of Untitled, it now says VP Test 1, the name we gave it. Now, whenever we return to this document and make changes, we just need to select Save to save those changes. If we forgot to save and try to close our document, a program will usually ask us if we want to save our work. I'll show you. The insertion point is still where we left it. Press Enter to go to a third line and type One More Line. Now, click to open the File menu and select the Exit command at the bottom of the list. There's your safety net. A message box appears asking if we want to save the changes. Click Yes, and both the message box and our notepad document close. We don't need to go through the Save As dialog box again because we already gave this file a name and a location. Now let's see how to open this file. Click the Start button to open the menu, and then click My Documents. We're now in the My Documents folder, where we can easily find any files we've saved here. Look in this window, and we see our newly created VP Lesson Files folder. Double-click the folder to open it, and there is our VP Test 1 file right where we put it. Just double-click on it to open it. Your computer automatically launches Notepad and displays the file. This works the same for all files you create and save on your computer. Click the X in the upper right corner of the window to close Notepad, and then close the VP Lesson Files window. We looked at the major features of Windows XP and have seen how the operating system manages files. The operating system also manages your computer resources, including all the hardware connected to the CPU. Let's take a look at one example of that process by moving on and exploring the control panel. By now, we're starting to see just how powerful Windows is with its menus and commands that let us do literally hundreds of tasks on our computer. Another nice feature is the control panel, which gives us the ability to personalize our Windows appearance. With just a few mouse clicks, we can change the color and style of our windows and buttons, our desktop, and even our screensaver. We'll use the control panel to see how we can customize windows to suit our personal preferences. The control panel contains tools that allow us to change the settings on our computer, add users, and add and remove programs. We will return to the control panel throughout my next two lessons for a variety of tasks, but for now, we'll use it to customize windows. Let's begin by closing any open windows. Remember, you can tell if any windows are currently open by looking at the taskbar. If you find any window buttons on the taskbar, right-click the button to open the shortcut menu. When the menu opens, select the Close command. When you're done, let's open the Control Panel from the Start menu. 
click the Start button. The control panel should be on the right side of the Start menu. It's an icon of a pencil writing on a slate. Click it to open the control panel. For those of you who may be familiar with older versions of Windows, this display looks a little different. Let's make sure we're all looking at the same display. Look over on the left column of the window, under the control panel heading. If you see a link labeled Switch to Classic View, click it. Viewers, you may already have this view from when you first opened the control panel. Notice we see icons displaying the many features available from the control panel. Let's go back to Category View. Over on the left side, click on Switch to Category View. Let's check out a couple of options for changing settings. Click the button labeled Date, Time, Language, and Regional Options. Under Pick a Task, click the green arrow next to Change the Date and Time. We now see a calendar and a clock. By clicking the arrows next to the month, year, and time, we can change our computer's internal clock. You can come here anytime to make changes, then click OK, and they will immediately take effect. There are also tabs here to change your time zone and to synchronize your computer's clock with an internet time server. By default, Windows automatically checks this option and synchronizes your computer's clock when your computer is connected to the internet. Suzanne's date and time are correct, so just click Cancel, and we're back at the date and time window. There are also advanced options for changing our settings to allow international number, date, and time formatting, and for adding additional languages so we can create documents containing more than one language. Click the Back button to return to the control panel. Let's try another option. Click Appearance and Themes. This time, find the display icon under or pick a control panel icon and click it. Here is the Display Properties dialog box with five tabs that control different aspects of our monitor display. This feature lets us customize our desktop display settings. The first tab is Themes. Windows XP has created a group of backgrounds, colors, and other items that go together. Click the drop down arrow to view a list of other available themes. Try clicking on some of them to display a sample of that theme in the preview window. But we're not limited by the parameters of colors, background, and text setup offered in the theme choices. Click the next tab, Desktop. The Desktop tab allows us to individually change the color, picture, or appearance of our desktop. We can set a background picture by choosing items from the list in the bottom window, and the small monitor will display what it will look like on our desktop. Scroll down to Gone Fishing and click it. This changes our background to another picture. Viewers, feel free to pause the lesson if you like and experiment with these options. After choosing a background, we can position it in one of several ways on our screen. Find the Position field on the right side and click the down arrow next to it. Here are three choices, Center, Tile, and Stretch. Clicking each one gives us a preview of the different ways our background can be displayed. If you want to find a background and position you like, just click Apply. Otherwise, you can leave it at your original setting. Before we leave this tab, click Customize Desktop. After you've become familiar with Windows, you can come here and customize the appearance of your icons and display a web page on your desktop. I suggest not making any changes here, though, until you're more familiar with the default settings that Windows provides. Click Cancel to return to Display Properties. and click the Screensaver tab. Here we can choose a screensaver and determine how long a time it takes after we stop using our computer before it becomes active. 
A screensaver is a control that prevents a picture on screen from being burned into your monitor, creating ghosts and images in the background while you're working. Most monitors today don't have this problem, but screensavers can still be fun to look at. The screensaver creates movement or changes pictures to keep your monitor's image fresh. Click the down arrow in the screensaver field to display the drop down list of choices. Go ahead and select one by clicking it, and wait to see the preview in the Display Properties box. If you find a screensaver you like and want to see how it will look on your screen, press the Preview button and your screen will convert to the screensaver for a few moments before returning to the Display Properties box. Many of these screensavers can be modified by clicking the Settings button. Here we can change things like shape, speed, and color of the screensaver. Close this window to return to the Screensaver tab. Clicking the Power button opens a dialog box where you can save power by allowing your monitor to turn off after a designated amount of time. Click Cancel to return to the Screensaver window. Viewers, choose any screensaver that interests you. You can always return and experiment with this later. When you're done, click the Appearance tab. This set of controls defines the colors you see on your desktop, title bars, buttons, and open windows. The field under Windows and Buttons lets us choose between the Windows Classic style and the standard Windows XP style. Move down the box and click the drop down arrow next to the color scheme field to see the list of color styles available. Selecting a color scheme here will display that scheme in the sample window above. If you like, you can pause the lesson here and play around until you find the colors you want. If you find one, go ahead and select it. The next box, Font Size, allows us to change the size of the fonts used in our windows and desktop. Normal is the default size, but we can increase our font with these two other options. To the right, the Effects button opens a dialog box of options for applying different transitions when displaying menus and tooltips. And for setting other visual effects for menus, icons, and fonts. I suggest leaving these at the default for now and returning to explore them on your own. Click Cancel. And we're back at the Appearance tab. The Advanced button offers more customizing of your menus, fonts, and icons, but it's only for Windows Classic theme. Let's move on to the Settings tab. Here we can change the resolution or size of the way information is presented on our computer screen. Moving this slider bar will make objects appear bigger or smaller. Try a few out and see which setting you like the most. Keep in mind, the bigger the screen area is, the more you can see, but the objects on the screen will be smaller and harder to see. Clicking Apply will display all the choices we have made on the desktop. Selecting OK will invoke all the changes we've made and close the Display Properties dialog box and clicking Cancel will close the dialog box without applying any changes. Unless you want to change any of the default settings, let's click Cancel to keep the settings we had. Back at the Appearance and Themes window, click the Back button to get back to the Pick a Category page. When you're there, click User Accounts. As we've seen, Windows XP allows us to customize the desktop to our liking. And from the control panel, we also have the ability to create even more accounts. Suzanne, let's change the name on your account. Viewers, you can choose your own name when you see it in the User Accounts window. Under the heading, Pick a Task, click Change an Account. And in the window that opens, click Suzanne. Viewers, find the account you want to work with and click it. On the left, we have several choices to customize our account. Click Change My Name. Suzanne, type in your full name and click Change Name.
Next, let's create a password for Suzanne's account. Passwords help protect our computer from unauthorized use, and they are also necessary for some of the things we'll be doing in Lesson 3. Click Create a Password. This is where we'll enter our new password. Keep in mind that by creating a password, Suzanne may lose some stored passwords to websites that she has previously saved. You can follow along with Suzanne here or just watch as she completes this exercise. In the first box, type a password that you can easily remember. I suggest writing down your new password and storing it in a safe place. Retype the password in the second box. The third box lets us type a word that reminds us of what our password is. Since Suzanne works at Video Professor, she will use the word work as her hint. When you're done, click Create Password. If you get a screen asking whether you want to make your files and folder private, click No. We're back at our User Accounts window. Notice, we now have two new options. The Create Password button is now titled Change the Password. We can come here anytime to enter a different password. Just below that is a new button, Remove the Password, in case we no longer want our account to be password protected. While we're here, let's change the picture icon. Click Change My Picture. Windows XP has provided an assortment of pictures to insert. You even have the option of using your own pictures. If you would like to use your own pictures, click the button labeled Using Your Own Picture on the left side of the box and follow the instructions. Suzanne likes the picture of the cat at the end of the first row. Viewers, you can choose any picture that you like. And when you're ready, click Change Picture. And there's your new name and picture to identify your account, Suzanne. We'll return later on and continue exploring the control panel. We're almost done, but before we leave, Suzanne will demonstrate how to properly turn off the computer. Viewers, you can sit back and watch as she goes through the steps. First, close all open windows so nothing shows on the taskbar. Open the Start menu. And at the bottom right side of the menu, click Turn Off Computer. When the small window displays, select Turn Off, and the computer will shut down. Some computers will shut off the power automatically, while others will require you to physically turn off the computer when the program tells you it is OK. You will need to manually turn off other hardware that may be on, such as your monitor and printer. In my next lesson on learning Windows XP, we'll explore many of the other functions and tools Windows has to offer. We will use the search command to find files stored on our computer, learn how to organize, manage, and move files and folders, and create shortcuts to help us navigate more efficiently around our computer. We'll find out how Windows Explorer lets us quickly access and manipulate our files and folders, and we will use the WordPad and Paint tools to create a memo and a map. Thank you for being such good students. And remember, there is always more you can learn from me, the Video Professor.